Ideas, the show where we look at misfires, mistakes, and miscalculations from all throughout history. I'm Tony Southcott. And I'm Albert Berg, and today we are brought to you by our featured patron, Noob MC Dad. Thank you, Noob. Tony's got our bad idea for us this week. Tony, what are we learning about? Uh, We're going to be learning about Zhu Zedong and his dismantling of traditional Chinese Kung Fu in China. Okay. Okay, a lot of uh, a lot of stuff to unpack there. So this guy's name, yes. I assume we're going to be hearing it a lot. Are you going to shorten it or I'm probably going to call him Zhu. Zhu. All right. I I don't want to yeah. I'm just I've, I've heard it as Zhu, here. I've heard it as Zhu. I've heard it a few different ways, but like we're just going to try to settle in with that. We are obviously not uh comfortable with a lot of Chinese pronunciations, but we will do our best. In April of 2017, Zhu Zhidong was challenged to f- a fight by a Tai Chi master. Zhu was a Chinese mixed martial artist, meaning that he used a combat system that covers all major phases of hand-to-hand combat, from standing to the ground game and grappling. Most MMA practitioners use a true mix of different styles. Kicks from Muay Thai, but kickboxing, wrestling from, well, wrestling submissions from jiu-jitsu, and the list goes on. This is where Wei Lei steps in. After some verbal sparring on Twitter, a Tai Chi master named Wei Lei challenged Zhu to a fight. Wei had been boasting of having special powers derived from his Tai Chi, such as force fields that could help keep a dove on his hand, or the ability to turn the insides of a watermelon to mush without breaking its skin. Much of this magical thinking is just accepted in China, as people believe martial artists can harness their chi and do all sorts of mystical things with it. So much so that this guy was given many television specials where he was basically beating up actors who were trying to beat him. It was exposed later that these were actors told to do their part. I mean, I gotta say, it doesn't take that much power to get a dove to sit on your finger. Maybe if it's... Yeah, especially because it was revealed later that his family had trained these dove- doves not to fly away. Yeah, that's that's how that works. The magical power of Tai Chi is just called, like, give it some bird seed every day and he'll be chill. Yeah, like it's just it's bizarre the things that he was uh, that he was talking about. I could see believing the watermelon thing too. Honestly, I'm not gonna rip on the Chinese people too hard because I could, I could imagine believing that some kind of pulse or sound wave or something could sort of disrupt the innards of a watermelon while leaving the outside intact. Yeah, and I'm going to be saying a lot of negative things about this type of kung fu. That's mostly like the energy style where people just flop. I want people, and I mean this in the best possible way, you will lose half of your afternoon to go to Instagram or Twitter or Facebook and look up McDojo Life. And you will see the type of stuff I'm talking about where somebody walks over, waves a hand, and eight people fall over. Or like they have a bunch of people attack them and they just barely touch them and they just go flying. Like this is the sort of martial arts we're talking about. I have no problems with Tai Chi or like Wang Chung, or any other form of Kung Fu as a discipline. I was about to ask for clarification on that. The Tai Chi is a subset of Kung Fu practice? Yes. Okay. Yes, it is a traditional Chinese martial art, usually used more for for focusing yourself. It's like very advanced stretching, and it's very good for meditation, for concentration, for doing a lot of things. It's actually required in a lot of schools over there. And it's the one you see whenever you see people like doing slow, like stretches and movements. And they're just like, they're just getting out there. But this guy is showing that using his force energy, he could launch five people off of him and all this. And so this is the guy who is challenging someone who has been fighting in mixed martial arts for around 20 years. Okay. So uh, this is a magic versus I punch you in the face and you fall down. I wonder yes. who will win. <laughs> well, we'll get to that. I can't possibly predict the end of this episode of Bad Ideas. <laughs> in a basement dojo in Chengju, the two martial artists face each other. Weili brought his hands up in a pose reminiscent of a praying mantis and advanced towards Zhu. The crowd around them watched on, nearly every single person having their camera phone out. Each camp believed that their martial art would prevail and send the other home bloody and embarrassed. They circled on black and white square mats that alternated like a chessboard. Zhu swung his right hand and went right through the mystical force field connected with Wei Lei's bald head. Wei Lei started to move back, but took five more blows before hitting the mat. In true MMA fashion, Zhu hit his downed opponent with about ten more punches before the match was called. Twelve total seconds had passed. So, he just punches this guy. 
Like there's not there's not even really a fight. No, he like he goes up, he throws the punch, it goes through. And the problem with these types of masters is that they haven't spent a lot of time sparring, and you can tell that the moment they actually get hit in the face, that they haven't learned how to handle that. I was going to ask for clarification on that also. Like, this guy is a a master of this art, we will call it, of Tai Chi Kung Fu magic. But does he actually know anything about fighting? Like, if you went to this guy's, I don't know, would you call it a dojo? The place where he's teaching you how to do what he does. Are you going to learn how to actually fight? Or is it just going to be about focusing your energy to explode watermelons? From the inside. It's mostly about focusing your energy. Like, you might learn some Tai Chi, you might get nice and, like, limber, and you might be able to do some of that. Will you learn how to meditate? Will you at least be improved in your mind? Uh, you'll be improved in your mind, but you're not going to know anything about how to fight. And this is why I have such a virulent hatred for the fake martial arts out there that do this. Because if it comes down to a situation where people think that they can defend themselves in a real-life situation and this is the martial arts they're taught, they're in for a very brutal and horrible surprise. Especially when these are the people that are doing, like, like anti-rape classes and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. I I was gonna say, you know, I... As someone who is religious, you know, I go to church and we learn about spiritual stuff, but we don't teach that Jesus is gonna come down and punch somebody in the face if you get attacked. Because that would be stupid. Like, you should learn how to fight if you think you're going to get in a fight. <laughs> yeah. And that's that's the biggest thing about this is that so many of these guys they don't spar, they don't like uh they don't do anything that if they are in a real fight and a lot of them buy into their own hype because they have legions of people that just do this where like they can pretend that they're putting like a a force onto somebody to make them pass out. It's all over American martial arts like from a bunch of these little they call them McDojos. A McDojo is a slur term for like the pop-up martial arts that just happened. Oh, I picked up on how that works, yes. It's just insane to see. And every time uh, 20, 20 or 60 Minutes has tried to show, they'll bring somebody and they're like, oh, it didn't work because they were a skeptic. And I shouldn't be telling you this, but if you lift your right toe, it no longer works because it doesn't have a magnetic connection anymore. And it's just always excuses, always insanity. And Zhu Zidong is just trying to expose this. The obvious question at this point... And maybe you have more to say. Maybe this question should come later. How much of this is these people being self-deluded and how much of it is a straight up scam? I would say that the ones that are practicing the force energy style are self-delusional. And the ones that that are doing like uh, we'll we'll talk about one doing Wang Chung later, which is uh, the martial art that Bruce Lee was raised on. And, like, he ended up adapting stuff later. We'll talk about a lot of this. Okay. There are people that are practicing real martial arts that just aren't as effective because they aren't taking into account how actual physics works. Those people are more legit than others because you actually can hit somebody and sometimes they spar and sometimes they know how to take a punch. But a lot of the ones that are doing four stuff are delusional. Hand-to-hand combat in humans is as old as our species. We've been trying to find the best way to pummel each other to death For a very long time. In the past, combat systems took these physical arts from brute force winging it to honed systems of pugilism. From wild haymakers and scraps to kung fu and Thai boxing. All the way up until the early 90s, there were massive debates about the superior styles. Could a taekwondo fighter beat a judo player? Could a Wing Chun practitioner beat an American boxer? People in their training dojos and gyms insisted that their styles were completely impregnable that they had the upper hand in any unarmed conflict, and obviously they were the best style of self-defense. Or offense, if it was in a kung fu movie. We never had answers to this outside of some freak show fights. There were instances of open martial arts tournaments in ancient Greece called Pancration, and indeed Pancras is still a form of martial arts today. China had its own no-holds-barred style called Lei Tai, but it didn't make it into modern times. Even the French have a style called Savat that was bare-knuckle boxing with kicks thrown in. There's about a four-hour podcast of history right now I could do on the early foundations of MMA, so we're going to kind of truncate this a little bit. I was going to say, I feel like we're getting into an area of personal expertise from you, Tony, where you could just talk for a while. Yeah, I love that. This is something that (laughs) I really love. I'm cutting it off because I don't want to put people to sleep that aren't into fighting. I will say that we did see a few of these uh, mixed martial arts things happening in the 50s with people like Judo Jean LaBelle taking on boxer Milo Savage or the Gracies 
especially in the 50s, taking on uh, pretty much all comers and having some pretty incredible bouts going on there. Even Muhammad Ali had a fight against a professional wrestler in the interest of seeing which style would win. Yeah, it's an interesting question because you have these fighting styles that are essentially sports, right? Because we don't want to kill each other for real. So we have all these things where we're like, well, don't hit them this way because that'll kill them. Or there's rules, right? There's like sets of guidelines to follow, but that's not how actual fighting would usually work. Yeah. And even in like the UFC and certain types of uh, MMA, there are different rules, like no kicks to the head of a grounded opponent because it's like head stomps that are just brutal to watch where even somebody who watches as much as I do is like, I get kind of squeamish watching some of that because it's just so much above. They also have like no small joint manipulation. So you can't rip at people's fingers. Like you can do like the elbow, the knee, like you can do all sorts of other stuff with uh, joint manipulation, but they don't want you breaking fingers. They don't want you gouging eyes. They don't want you kicking to the groin, things like that. The way mixed martial arts actually started is often considered something that Bruce Lee did because Bruce Lee combined Wing Chun with different forms of Kung Fu and wrestling into Jeet Kune Do. It was when you actually started seeing taking the best aspects from each type of fighting and making one instead of going into the into just your style. Uh, he said that the best fighter is not a boxer, karate, or judo man. The best fighter is someone who can de- adapt to any style, to be formless, to adopt an individual's own style, and not following the system of styles. And that brings us to the modern era, where in the 1990s we had the UFC. And in a gross oversimplification, we saw mighty stand-up fighters dragged to the ground and choked into unconsciousness by men like Hoist Gracie, who know jiu-jitsu. We watched wrestlers who learned to counter submission fighting and smash faces like Mark Kerr, and then we saw the evolution of the, the rounded fighter like Fedor Emelianenko, who brought combined grappling and striking. And that's where we're at today, and it's constantly like uh, some things get more popular, some things fade away, and it goes in kind of a cycle. So to make an already short story even shorter, what Tony's saying is we have a pretty good idea of what a good fight looks like these days. And it's not magic people shooting energy out of their hands yeah and occasionally you will see a guy that has like a kung fu background come up and do pretty incredible things like a guy named israel adesanya and all that but he's doing the rounded stuff and taking things that work for him so it's not to say that these aren't real martial arts once again i'm more talking about the kung fu masters and their cult-like zeal that their students have towards them you can find these displays of power online all over the place and like i said check out mcdojo check out just look up fake uh kung fu on youtube you'll see it all day long yeah you sent me some videos before we uh recorded earlier in the week of a guy just like lightly tapping some people and having them fall down it's it's just rampant it's ridiculous but back to zhu and his quest and why this is ultimately a bad idea not just for kung fu practitioners but by the Chinese government. When the video went viral, traditionalists lost their minds. Immediately, Zhu was banned from all forms of social media. He was accused of suspected illegal actions that violate the morals of martial arts by various associations. He was immediately doxxed, and death threats started raining down towards his family. God, there's so much here. Now we're in stuff that I personally dislike. I don't actually yeah. care about the fighting, but I'm not a big fan of the Chinese government these days. No, we we have a, a few episodes on that because he's actually part of the uh, social the social credit score system that we talked about in a previous episode. It got so serious that a Chinese businessman offered about one point four million dollars to anyone who could beat Zhu in traditional martial arts. Dozens of people wanted rematches and even camped out at Zhu's gym in Beijing. The rise of Chinese nationalism under President totalitarian and Pooh Bear impersonator Xi Jinping has led to a greater love for the traditional Eastern martial arts. Policies have made it so that challenging these are a direct challenge to Chinese culture. It's something where you see weekly like uh, demos and things during commercial breaks on TV showing off just how great these martial arts are. And this started because of, in the 70s, the rise of kung fu movies. It became just ingrained in their culture. Right, but those are movies. Yes, they're movies. They're and cool. I, I love kung fu movies. Like, I really do. It's, it's more of an expression of artistry than it is about a practical fi- fighting style. And you've got ones like Ip Man that have some root in reality, but it's not quite the same. People can't, like, stand on their tippy toes and then fly up to a tree branch and then do a flip off of it and kick you in the face. 
Zhu just wanted to expose the brainwashing that happens at these gyms. He didn't intend on sacrificing his freedom to do so. He didn't intend for his MMA gym to force him out after 20 years of hard work, the gym that he owned and operated to be taken from him. He didn't know he would get doxxed. He didn't know that he would be publicly harassed where anytime he'd try to leave a hotel or anything like that, people from other gyms would be waiting for him in the lobby to confront him. He didn't expect to be called a spy or to be accused of treason just because he was exposing what was fake. And this is the type of brainwashing and the type of just... I'm trying to even think of the word for it. It's just insane how far people are taking this. It's difficult to have your beliefs questioned, especially directly head on. I would say I am not this man and I don't have the desire to attack this and or the ability really because I'm not a fighter of any kind. But if you want to convince people that they're wrong, you can't just come straight at them and say you're wrong. You got to do the like, you know, there's something that's a little off about this. You know, like, I, I think this guy is cool. Don't get me wrong. But isn't there something just a little bit not right about this? You got you to gotta, like warm the water up slowly so the frog <laughs> doesn't hop out is what I'm yeah. saying. He probably should have gone a little bit less absolutely destroying people. But I think that that's also a proper way of doing it in this particular type of situation. The thing that gets really embarrassing later is whenever he's doing these bouts and he lets them hit him for a while, like sometimes for even an entire round, and then fights back just to prove that they don't know how to hit. But that's anyway. embarrassing. That's got to be bad when you're just like taking punches to the face like it's nothing. And the thing that's even more embarrassing is that he's admitted to be a past his prime mediocre MMA fighter. Well, yeah, you said he's been doing it for 20 years. You're doing anything for 20 years. You're not the best at it there's some young buck coming up who's like got the real moves going on and a lot of it is like it's that finding that balance between being a veteran who knows exactly everything that's happening in the ring and losing that ability because you've been in so many fights so like there's a nice sweet spot in your 30s that seems to be the prime for mma fighters but he's 40 now like yeah. he's already past that he's taken a lot of uh, a lot of damage to the gym just to be clear we are not inviting professional 40 year old fighters to to take us on. We, we believe that you're still really got it. And I don't at least maybe Tony's saying that there are people like uh, Dan Henderson and Randy Couture that fought into their fifties and were still champions. But man, that is the rarity. And like most of those guys will admit it. And I'm not, I'm never going to challenge anyone. This is a, a pro tip for people at home. If somebody has cauliflower ear, don't fight them ever run away. But, yes. <laughs> run away. Anyway, and, it's a good strategy. Yeah. <laughs> and most martial artists will tell you that if you're in a bad situation, your best option is usually to run. But we're getting a little bit off the off the mark here. Some of this has a monetary base to it. Wushu, which is a very acrobatic form of kung fu that often looks more like dancing than fighting, is big business in China. It has more than 12,000 academies in the country, but it is slowly losing some members to Western-style fighting. The UFC is seeking the Chinese market and finding some incredible fighters like Zhang Weilei, the current women's strawweight title holder. I honestly thought it was going to be a fair amount of time before China produced a full-on champion because they were not as immersed in like MMA. They weren't training in it, but they already have the 115-pound women's champion, and she's fighting here soon. She's an incredible fighter, and that's part of the thing that's pushing the Western style of combat into China is because of how, how loved she is. I, you know, I've been thinking about Instead of what embracing, you've been saying about uh, this love of this type of fighting in Chinese culture, and I thought of an analogy, uh, and maybe this will be a, a bad analogy, but it it made me think, like, imagine if you went to the police academy in your state and you were going to learn how to handle yourself in a fight, and they were like, all right, now here's how you do the jumping through the air with one gun in each hand firing at the bad guys and then slide on the table. <laughs> like nobody does that in real life. It's just the movies and it looks cool in the movies, but let us stay in the movies as a tactic. Sorry, I, I derailed you there. I Instead of embracing the times change, they are doubling down. They've been pushing the Shaolin monks to higher prominence. The once clannish monks now give daily shows to tourists showing off their martial prowess. Jackie Chan is now an advisor for the Chinese government, bringing more people using his reputation and advertising the martial arts. Zhu is banned from doing any sort of exhibition fights or tournaments on the premises of his gym after this point. 
I already talked about that he eventually can't even go back to the gym, and that's kind of where it stands right now. But before they did that, they made it illegal for him to set up any sort of exhibition fight, any sort of tournament, and basically tried to stop him at every turn. They tried to find some martial artist that could actually beat him so that they could full-on expose it. At this point, he could actually have fights, but he had to do it with clown makeup on, so that if he, when he eventually lost, they could literally make him look like a clown. And they also made him go under the pseudonym, which translated to Shoe Wintermelon, which was basically making fun of him for being a little bit chubby. So this is official government policy that this guy has to fight with clown makeup on, and also we have a funny name for him? Yeah, it was basically the board that controlled exhibition fights. Like in the U.S., we have like the Nevada State Fighting Commission and so on that makes sure that fights are going to be even, that people are on weight, that there's judges, that uh, it's not going to be something where it's just backyard boxing. They basically use that to start doing this sort of thing. And they also are part of the reason why he started getting sued so much. Beyond being a social pariah, the courts are against him as well, sending huge fines for simply calling certain masters frauds. He had to pay $60,000 and apologize for seven days to one of the people that he offended. This is... I'm glad that I do not live in China at the moment. And I'm not saying that America is perfect. I'm just saying we're better. (laughs) The next person he fought was a Wing Chun master named Ding Hao. And people thought this was going to be big, so they actually allowed it to be on state TV. And it was a horrible work from the judges. A horrible work? What now? I I didn't understand that sentence. A work means that so it was basically rigged. Oh, okay. And in this fight, Zhu let Hao hit him many, many times in about the first 20 seconds. He probably took about 10 punches and then proceeded to go after him. He knocked down Hao six different times, each time dropping him to the ground with punches or literally throwing him to the ground. And whatever, a flurry finally stopped the fight, like the ref came over and stopped it because Hao was getting just destroyed. They brought them out to announce the winner as you do, and they called it a draw. Okay. So they're just straight up cheating. Yeah, it's just dishonest. I mean, I guess, I I don't know if you can cheat when you're the ref, but, like, it's gross. You can definitely pay off refs. Like, refs are able to. This wasn't the ref that decided it. I'm sure the ref was just told to declare both a draw at the end. Or a win if he could manage it. It's like, even if he were to have knocked Howe into unconsciousness, they probably would have called it a draw. He won by technical knockout, which means that the other guy basically gave up because he was taking too many strikes to the face. <sighs> Zhu Zhidong continues to speak out against these fake practices and fraud martial arts at the cost of his freedom and social standing. He's now knocked out and defeated 17 such frauds out of 17. There hasn't been anyone that got close to him. Some of them look like he was actually giving a good fight, such as uh, one Kung Fu master that he fought in a ring, and then he ended up giving him a flying knee to the heart that knocked this guy completely out of the fight. It was one of the more be- brutal and beautiful flying knees I've ever seen. But some would call all of this a bad idea. I believe that the bad idea is encouraging people to believe and propagate combat systems that don't work just because it looks cool, because it feeds the ego of certain instructors, and it promotes nationalism. If it doesn't work on a below-average 41-year-old MMA teacher, then it really is not a combat system that should be employed beyond that. You have to take what works. You have to look at what's real if you're teaching people how to defend themselves. And if it doesn't work, you need to move on. And if you have a system, I mean, you mentioned this, like it's got to work, right? You To bring it back to the gun analogy, because this is America, like no matter how cool your gun is, if it doesn't hit the target when you pull the trigger that you're aiming at, and you're not bad at shooting, I mean, like if, if it's not working, you shouldn't use the thing. Like it might be great yeah. for mental clarity as we already mentioned if there's a a med i know that there is a meditation aspect of tai chi there is a guy that i follow on youtube who talks about the clarity that he gets from doing this mental stuff and from doing the movements he he incorporates it as a uh, what would you call it a transformative he wouldn't call it spiritual because he doesn't believe in the metaphysical but you know a way to train your mind and a and make it better and sharper but you don't use it for things that it doesn't work for 
Yeah. Martial arts like that can be a great tool for releasing the potential of, of a person through discipline and effort. It's a great way to focus your energy, get rid of anxiety. And there's a lot of wonderful things it can do, but it, and it doesn't have to stack up to a vicious MMA fight because most people aren't going to be in situations where they're in a fight. But whenever you claim that, it, it just completely gets rid of the value of, of the martial art. Whenever you think that you can death touch somebody because your students fall over, it's not creating anything of value. And I think that's whenever you need someone like Zhu Zhidong to come and put the leather to them and prove that this stuff doesn't work. And I know it's hard for them to swallow, but it's atrocious what they're doing to this man for simply showing what works. Oh boy, not a big fan of any of that. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I don't even have a coherent thought other than this is so obviously wrong from the outside. And I understand like wanting to keep your reputation, but ah. <laughs> <laughs> I, this is not a good way for me to cl to respond and close things out here. I feel like I'm failing. That's no, okay. <sighs> I think we've already got what we needed to from this episode. I'd okay. love to hear what you guys think. So you can tweet us at human echoes, go to our Instagram, do anything like that. We'd love to hear from you. Also, if you have show ideas, go to bad ideas, show at gmail.com and we will definitely take them into account. If you really enjoy this, check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash human echoes. And I hope you guys have an excellent week. We'll be back next Friday. Bye, guys.